Truth was lost and hearts were frozen From you, Allah came a prophet chosen Blessed prophet Muhammad, obedient to you Taught us the things we ought to do He taught us for certain that you are one And that you have neither a daughter nor son He taught us to be good to our mother and father And that paradise lies under the feet of our mother I love you, my prophet And sing your praise And follow your sunnah Prophetic ways I love you, my prophet And sing your praise And follow your sunnah Prophetic ways Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah Welcome to our program, Back to the Prophet. In this program, we're trying to examine the life example of the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, as a guide to understanding our religion, the religion of Islam, the Qur'an and the hadiths of the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, so that we can better understand their meaning and apply them in our own lives, in our own circumstances. Uh, we're talking about the beginning of the revelation of the Holy Quran to the Prophet Muhammad, which began when he was age 40 in the cave of Hira. And that began with the revelation of Surah uh, Al-Alaq, Bismi Rabbika Aladhi Khalaq, read in the name of your Lord who created. After that, when the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, saw the angel Gabriel uh, once again on the horizon in his real form, uh, sitting upon his throne, uh, it was a very startling revelation. He went to his wife Khadija and told her to cover him up. He was covered in his blanket. And Allah uh, sent down the revelation to him, Ya ayyuha al-mudathir, qum fa'andir, wa rabbaka fa'kabbir, wa thiyabaka fa'tahhir, wa la tamnun tastakthir, wa la rabbika fa'sbir. O you who is wrapped up in his garments, arise and warn. That is, uh, get out of your home, out of your comfort zone, and go out and warn people that their lives of evil and corruption are leading them to destruction, that when we disobey Allah's will, we are leading to the destruction of our society and civilizations and harm to our own souls uh, eternally in hellfire. قُمْ فَأَنذِرْ Arise and warn. وَرَبَّكَ فَكَبِّرْ And magnify your Lord. That is, takbir, the Allah Almighty, our Creator and our Sustainer, is greater than all things. His power, His knowledge, and every aspect of Allah's attributes is greater and more perfect than anything else in the universe. But everything receives its power only from Allah Almighty. وَثِيَابَكَ فَالطَّحِرْ And literally, purify your garments. Literally, that means that your garments in Islam should be pure from uncleanliness. When you worship God, you should worship in a clean body, clean garments, praising Allah Almighty in the best appearance and zina, the best uh, adornment and attractive appearance that you can according to the Islamic standards and purify your heart from evil and wickedness and uh, arrogance, but be a, a humble and a good uh, a follower and servant of Allah Almighty. Warudza fahjur, and defy all kind of defilement and uncleanliness shun in your life. The literal uncleanliness or impure impurities and the spiritual impurities of evil and wickedness. Walatamnun tastakthir, and do not. Uh, uh, seek to give yourself gain. Do not try to benefit materially from your role as Prophet of Allah and Messenger to humanity. So the Prophet Muhammad, even though peace and blessings be upon him, 
He enjoyed a life of uh, wealth and security as a wealthy businessman and the husband of Khadija, uh, radiallahu anha, may Allah be pleased with her. Yet he was asked to give up everything for the sake of religion, for the sake of his message of Islam, and to receive no worldly benefit or wealth, and to not seek to give himself any gain through the message of Islam. Wali rabbika fasbir, and be patient and steadfast with your Lord. That is, you're going to be tried and tested in your faith, O Muhammad. Difficulties are going to ensue. People are not going to overnight embrace your message with uh, affection and love toward you. But you will have to be patient. And so the Prophet began his outward campaign going to his own people. And he went and stood on the mountain of Safa. The mountain of Safa is nearby the Kaaba. When you depart from uh, where the black stone, the cornerstone of the Kaaba, you pass by the well of Zemzem, then you will get to the gate which will lead you to a small hill, a small mountain called Asafa. And between that hill and Al Marwa, the uh, Muslim pilgrims, whether on Hajj, the major annual pilgrimage, or Umrah, the minor uh, pilgrimage that is performed all year long, they go and make the Sa'i seven times between those hills. And the story of Safa and Marwa is that Hajar, the wife and former slave of Ibrahim, the mother of Ismail, when she was left by Ibrahim in this valley with no vegetation, she was thirsty, she had no water, she could not nurse her child, Ismail. And so she went from these two hills, Safa and Marwa, looking for help. She believed that Allah would send help to her. But when she heard her baby crying, she had left the baby under a bush. And so she went back down below a Safa and she found the well of Zemzem springing up out of the ground. She was able to drink of that water and nurse her child. That well attracted the birds in the desert. And when the passing caravan saw birds on the horizon over that valley, they knew there must be water and vegetation. So they went and found Hajar and Ismail there at this well of Zemzem. And they knew that this was a sign of God's protection upon her. And so they cared for her and they dwelt there peacefully with her. Eventually Ismail married a daughter of one of the local chiefs. And when Abraham, his father, returned, when he was an adult, uh, he found where he had left Hajar in the care of Allah, now a city, the city of Mecca had been founded. And he and Ismail built the Beit Allah, the house of God, the Kaaba, there in Mecca, and called all of humanity to the pilgrimage. And so Safa and Marwa were part of this holy sanctuary nearby the Kaaba, between the black stone, after you pass by the well of Zemzem. And so this is a place where all the pilgrims would visit. And the Prophet Muhammad climbed on top of this mountain and he addressed the people. And before Islam, he had been known as a person of high uh, moral character and a person who was very trustworthy. He was called Al-Amin, the one you can trust no matter what. People trusted him with their money and with their lives. And he said, uh, if I tell you that there is an enemy over the side of this mountain and they're on the way to attack you, will you believe me? And they said, oh, certainly you are Al-Amin. We will believe you, O Muhammad. So he said, I'm warning you of the coming chastisement of Allah Almighty. So Allah had told, told him, Qum fandir, arise and warn. So he gave a warning. If you continue on the path of worshipping other gods beside your creator and living a life of evil uh, and tyranny and oppression, you will be destroyed by Allah. And so if you believe me, that an enemy is coming, I'm going to tell you about a much worse destruction that will come to you from Allah, your Lord and Creator. But then, the same people who had said they would trust him and believe him, now they ridiculed him and rejected and denied him. And so the Prophet ﷺ was rejected by the majority of his people. Those people who initially followed him 
his wife, his close friend Abu Bakr, Ali, his cousin, and some of the poor people, slaves, foreigners of Mecca. But his own relatives, his clan of Quraysh, who were the nobility and the leadership, uh, firmly rejected his message and ridiculed and denied him. And so he realized then, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَلِرَبِّكَ فَاسْبِرْ Therefore, be patient unto your, unto your Lord, be patient. Turn unto your sustainer and be steadfast. Don't give up hope. There's a long road ahead of you to the success of Islam. And so this initial stage in the lifetime of the Prophet Muhammad, delivering his message, there was a great deal of disappointment that his people would not necessarily follow him and believe in him, but he would have to endure a great deal of persecu persecution and he would not be able to achieve any worldly benefit out of the message of Islam. Uh, people asked him, how does the revelation come to you, O Muhammad? And all of us today, we, you know, what is revelation and what does that mean? In Arabic, of course, revelation or wahi, it could mean inspiration. Uh, it is a message delivered to the human being in their heart or mind uh, from God Almighty directly or through the angel Gabriel, the angel of revelation, Jibra'il. And so at a later date, the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, was asked about revelation and how it comes to be. And he said, Ahyanin yati kasalsalati jaras. It comes to me like the ringing of a bell. And that is the hardest for me. So the Prophet would uh, hear as a vibration in, in his mind or his heart as if you were close to a bell and you heard it ringing and it resonates and it causes a kind of vibration. And uh, after he heard that, he would understand وَقَدْ وَعَيْتُ عَنْهُ مَا قَالْ then he would understand what Allah's revelation was to him. And so it would come upon his qalb, his heart, or his, the mind of the Prophet ﷺ. Sometimes the angel appears to me in the form of a man. And so that happened even sometimes before the companions. And so the angel Gabriel appeared when he was five in the form of a man. And in the famous hadith we call hadith of Jibrail, the hadith of Gabriel, uh, the Sahaba were, were, were sitting with the Prophet when out of the desert suddenly came a man uh, with glowing white robes. But he appeared to be a human being. But there was no sign of dust as if he had just crossed the desert as a traveler. And he sat by the Prophet and asked him, about the definition of iman or faith, Islam or submission, and ihsan, the perfection of religion. And he came in the form of a human being. We'll go back to a break. We'll be back shortly. I love you, my prophet, and sing your praise, and follow your sunnah, prophetic way. Hopefully we'll discuss some, some tips on, on how to increase the, the ability of getting the du'a or the supplication answered. Allah delays giving you what you want and gives you a reward that is equal to that or better in this life or in the world to come uh, for giving you your sins and giving you good deeds. I'm going to look at some questions that we've asked some of our brothers on the street. Uh, we asked them, should Muslims have a dialogue with other religions? We're going to need some stability. So we, uh, it doesn't matter where we live, we need to care for those ones to give them the rights that Allah gives. This life is not the eternal life, it is a test. Particularly for the youth of today. So if there are any parents or uncles or whoever is watching, if you have 16, 17, 18, 20 year olds with you, make sure they stop doing whatever they're doing and come in and watch this show, inshallah. <laughs> I 
my prophet and sing your praise and follow your sunnah prophetic way. Assalamu alaikum. Welcome back. Uh, before the break, we were talking about how revelation or wahi came to the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. And sometimes uh, he felt a, a, a vibration, like a resonance, like a bell, and then he would clearly understand the message of the Qur'an after, he, uh, uh, after that revelation uh, ended. And sometimes he would see the angel in the form of a man. And that was witnessed by the companions in the famous hadith, which, in which Gabriel came as the form of a man and asked the Prophet about Iman, Islam, and Ihsan. That is, faith, belief in uh, the six pillars of belief or faith in Islam, the five pillars of Islam, our outward actions and our inward beliefs, and Ihsan, the perfection of our faith by worshipping God as if he as if you could see him in front of you, for although we cannot see Allah Almighty, Allah always sees us. And so we worship always in a complete consciousness of Allah Almighty to have sincere uh, and perfect faith, God willing. And so the Sahaba witnessed that, and when this man left, they were really puzzled, like, who is this guy? He came out of the desert, yet he's not sweating, he's not dirty from a journey, his clothes were all white, and everything about him was very strange. And he said, yes, that was Gabriel who came to teach you about your religion. And so the angel would come to the Prophet Muhammad and he would understand him. Uh, Aisha talked about when the revelation would come to the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam. that it was something physical. So sometimes people would ask the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam, or he would just be doing something, and in his mind he would hear that vibration like a bell, and then his eyes would close and he would lower his head as if a great weight was upon him. And so his body would go low or sometimes he would lie down and be covered with a blanket. And so Aisha, radiallahu anha, his wife, peace, uh, uh, may Allah be pleased with her, said, I saw him, I saw the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam on a very cold day and the revelation came to him. And as the state of inspiration departed from him, his forehead was dripping with sweat. And so the coming of the revelation was something that the Sahaba, the Prophet's own companions, could witness and they would understand. They would see him, suddenly he would go quiet, his hot head would bow, and he would start sweating, even though it was a very cold day. So something physical was happening to him. Uh, there are people who hated Islam from the first day, saying the Prophet was possessed or he was insane. And so people say, yes, he's, he's, he, uh, stuff Allah, Allah forgive us, that he was an insane person or suffering from epilepsy or seizures. But if you see a person suffering from seizures, first of all, they lose control over their bodily functions. And so they don't just sweat, but in fact they defile themselves and they cannot control their their bowel movements or their urine and so they dirty their clothes very often and when they awaken they do not awaken with knowledge or a revelation or a beautiful truth from God but in fact they are stricken by a very terrible disease and they are very unfortunate and there is nothing good that happens to them because of epilepsy but it's actually a, a, a terrible illness and people are very unfortunate when they have this or any other kind of serious illness. But the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, did not in any way uh, disgrace himself or appear anything wrong except he would awaken and then he would proclaim a message very clearly in the most beautiful Arabic language they had heard that clearly answered the needs of that time or the questions that were being asked or solve the problem which the Muslim community was enduring. So before the revelation would hit him, he would not have an answer. Then, for a brief time, he would be in an unconscious state, hearing that message in his heart or mind, and then he would awaken and deliver that message to the companions and to all of us generations thereafter. And so an insane person or a sick person cannot deliver 
words of infinite wisdom that have produced a beautiful civilization and that continue to guide billions of people for millennia after his lifetime. But the most that a person could do at that time would be to make up a false message that in the future would be clearly rejected by people as being incompatible with science or knowledge or civilization, not being the fount and source of science and knowledge of civilization, which is the Holy Quran. Because it was the book of Allah, it was not the creation of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. One time, Zayd ibn Thabit uh, narrates, the Prophet, peace be upon him, was resting his head upon my lap. So the Prophet was in a reclining position, resting his head on Zayd's lap. And he said, then the revelation came to him, and I felt a great weight on my lap. I thought my leg was going to be broken. And at other times, the Prophet was uh, riding on a camel. And if you haven't seen a camel, it's a very great, large creature. They are very strong and powerful and can carry great weights upon their backs. And so the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam was on the back of the camel and the revelation came to him and the great weight was physical and the camel felt it and the camel had to kneel down from the weight that was upon the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And so this revelation was not that the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, uh, sat about thinking about things and formulating his own ideas and speaking about them to people and exchanging ideas and conversation and then writing or dictating to others some message of his own creation or composition. But it was something that would happen to him when he least expected it. In a time when there was a need or a situation or a problem that needed to be solved, people would observe this sudden physical occurrence, then the Prophet would suddenly proclaim to them a message that he had not known moments before that. And so the message of the Qur'an was not his composition, his composition or his creation. It was not a, human, uh, a result of human creativity, but it was the words of Allah Almighty, the eternal word, from our Lord Almighty, uh, delivered to the Prophet Muhammad from the eternal tablet in heaven in the Arabic language so it could be understood by his people and delivered to him, delivered to them by the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. But the Prophet وسلم, was a highly intelligent person. He was not learned by books. He had not learned scriptures or books or traditions from the people of the book, the people of the scriptures. But the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam learned and understood from his own heart the message of the Qur'an and immediately applied it and was a good example of that Qur'an in daily practice. And his companions, whenever they would learn even a few verses, as I said, even if we learn five verses of the Qur'an, we wouldn't stop with it, we wouldn't start learning anything else before first we applied, we had to understand the application in real life of those verses and how to apply them in daily life. To the companions, the Qur'an was not just a book as we today, we hear it recited in the mosque or we read it ourselves or we listen to it uh, on recordings and it's recited as a beautiful work of art and it is very spiritual. People hear a beautiful recitation of the Qur'an, even they don't understand Arabic, but they are moved by its beauty. But they don't understand its meaning. And so as some of the companions said, we had a difficulty memorizing the Qur'an. Nowadays, the young children can memorize the entire Qur'an and, reciting it, and recite the Qur'an from beginning to end without even making one mistake. But we found it easy to apply the Qur'an and you find it difficult to apply. We found it difficult to memorize, but easy to apply. And so the companions learned the Qur'an little by little. Some of them only knew a few surahs by heart. Others knew the whole Qur'an by heart.
But every time they learned the ayahs, they would learn from the Prophet how to live those, the meaning of those verses in their life. So every verse, every chapter, the ayahs and surahs of the Holy Qur'an were meaningful to them. And they remembered what happened in the occasion of this revelation, uh, what was going on in the life. What did the Prophet say and do when this revelation came to him? And that is why uh, Omar used to dislike it. When Abu Huraira, radiallahu anhu, may Allah be pleased with him, one of the young Muslims who became Muslim in the end of the lifetime of the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him. And he learned from the Prophet many, many hadiths because he was a young uh, boy living as a poor person in the mosque of the Prophet. He was from Ahl al-Sufa, living in a raised platform in one side of the mosque, living on the charity of people. He had no job, he had no money of his own. So he memorized from the Prophet many hadiths and he learned many hadiths also from the companions. And so the Sahaba or the companions, they narrate from the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam sometimes directly or sometimes through other of the companions. And so Abu Huraira is the most prolific narrator of hadith. But the Prophet, but Omar ibn Khattab, uh, who was a close companion of the Prophet, criticized Abu Huraira and said, that's not how we used to narrate from the Prophet. Because we used to know how the Prophet lived it. If you simply recite hadiths and you're not aware of how the Prophet applied them, then you don't have the real knowledge. And so the real knowledge isn't from reciting hadiths or verses of the Quran, but from looking at the application, the real life example of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. May Allah guide us to the true real life application of the Quran and Sunnah. Jazakum Allah khair, may Allah reward you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. When truth was lost and hearts were frozen from you, Allah came a prophet chosen, blessed prophet Muhammad, obedient to you, taught us the things we ought to do. He taught us for certain that you are one and that you have neither a daughter nor son. He taught us to be good to our mother and father and that paradise lies under the feet of our mother. I love you, my prophet, and sing your praise and follow your sunnah, prophetic ways. I love you, my prophet, and sing your praise and follow your sunnah, prophetic ways.